Welcome back for Module 3 of the Financial Toolkit. In Module 3, we're going to discuss equity financing, and in particular, how to book the accounting when a company receives money from stockholders. I felt compelled to include this lesson among all the lessons that could be included in accounting for lawyers, because lawyers play such a central role in the equity financing process, especially for startup companies. Often the attorney needs to play many roles at once and not just draft the documents, but also understand the economic consequences of stock financing. So now let's talk about how accountants would view and book the type of stock financing transactions that attorneys might be responsible for performing. So let's get started with chapter 10, which is actually the third thing I cover in Financial Toolkit on equity financing, because Financial Toolkit's really about the accounting tools lawyers need to succeed in the legal profession. And so we don't cover all of the details about how to be a great accountant, but rather how to be great consumers of accounting information. And so we're going to keep that lens, keep that focus as we move into equity financing, which is really one of my favorite topics because my practice area, my practice background is in venture capital finance, which is a type of equity financing. So hopefully I'll dash a little bit of that in this lecture here and there. Let's get started then. We're going to do four things in this lecture. One, we're going to identify and explain characteristics of the corporate form of organization and classes of stock. We're then going to record and disclose preferred and common stock transactions, including stock splits. We're going to record and disclose cash dividends. And last, we're going to talk about stock dividends. Our first learning objective is our essential building block. Before we can get into any analysis, we have to know what we are working with. So first, we're going to identify and explain characteristics of the corporate form of organization and explain and identify the classes of stock. The accounting equation expresses a relationship. That is to say, assets equals liabilities plus equities actually has something to say about the relationship between entities. It actually tells us something about the assets owned by a corporation and the claim against those assets by creditors and stockholders. Creditors being a type of liability, stockholders being a type of equity, and assets, well, those are the assets owned by the corporation. Accounting for equity in a corporation requires a distinction between the two main sources of stockholders' equity, common stock and retained earnings. Their relationship to the accounting equation is shown in the next slide. Again, this is a lesson on equity financing, so we're going to focus on that aspect of the accounting equation. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. That's the fundamental equation of accounting, and it defines a relationship between the assets of a corporation and the residual claim that the equity holders, the shareholders, have over it. And that claim is really broken up most appropriately into two categories. On the one hand, we have what we call common stock, and that's the amount the shareholders paid to purchase common stock. So if you spent $1,000 on common stock, we're going to book common stock at 1000 It's original purchase price that was paid to the company. And that's distinguishable from retained earnings. Retained earnings are a function of income. When the company makes more income in a period than it had expenses, when it rather, let's be more formal and say when its revenue exceeds expenses over a period, the difference goes into retained earnings. It's the amount that the company made and didn't spend. And the equity owners, the owners of the common stock, they have a claim on that retained earnings. In fact, uh, there are ways for that to be distributed, as we'll see when we talk about dividends. For lawyers, this is probably real basic stuff, but let's review real quick, just in case you haven't taken corporations recently. 
Corporations are legal entities. They have their own EIN number, EIN, employer identification number, so number is redundant in saying that, but it's like a SSN, like a social security number, same number of digits, and it gives that entity status. It actually files taxes. It is legally separate from its owners, much to the chagrin of many people who derided cases like Citizens United, which said corporations could spend their money on elections and all sorts of things. Well, we're not here for the politics. We're here for the accounting. Corporations, their key feature is that they are legally separate from their owners. Their owners are shareholders. Each shareholder, well, they own shares of stock, shares as in percentages. You can think of stock as being a finite quantity. Let's say there's 100 shares of stock. If you have one, you have 1% of the company. The company is entirely owned by its shareholders, and they, in their total, comprise the ownership of that business. Corporations can be privately held or publicly held. A privately held corporation stock is not issued for sale to the general public, and it's subject to a lot fewer regulations. So a lot of companies that you know today are actually private companies because the world's gotten wonky. I have plenty of papers on this if you're interested and to why. But there are some really big private companies these days uh, or companies that, you know, have se since gone public. But, you know, a lot of the popular startups, you know, Uber, Pinterest, Instagram, uh, all those companies had a long life as a private company, even though they were... Uh, operating in a big way. The definition of a public company is one that is going to be selling its stock on a stock market, like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. And uh, those are really the most two popular exchanges in America today. So there are different accounting rules for the two of them, and that's why it matters in our accounting class. A corporation, some will say a corporation is, is a person. That's not true. Um, for example, corporations can have children. People can. Uh, corporations can't get married. Can't marry a corporation. People can. Corporations can't go to jail. How would you incarcerate a corporation? But corporations do have some rights that individuals do. For example, they pay taxes. They can enter into contracts. They can own property. They can sue and be sued. So we call this an entity. A corporation is a separate entity. You sue a corporation. You don't necessarily sue its owners. The corporation pays its own taxes. The owners don't necessarily incur a tax until they receive a dividend. And all of this means that we have to account for them separately. A couple other corporate features. Uh, a lot of regulations that pertain to corporations. Big area of specialization for many attorneys like myself. Corporations have indefinite life. They don't die. They, they don't, they're not born and they don't die. They are, they are created, they're incorporated, and they, they can be dissolved or unincorporated, but they tend to exist forever unless something uh, affects that. They can live forever, and some, in fact, have been around for hundreds of years. The owners of a corporation have limited liability, which is to say that its owners will not be responsible for paying its debts beyond what they've invested, so you can feel secure that they won't come after your house just because the corporation didn't pay for its copy paper. And corporations, because of these features, uh, as a function of these features, can usually acquire capital more easily than a person can. And they're sort of built for that. They're sort of capital-raising devices, instruments in the law. Let's get a little more specific with these. A corporation is created by law, and you can actually create a corporation in any state you want, no matter where you live. The corporation is going to be then formed uh, in America by, by a state. It's a matter of state law, a uh, concept called general incorporation. And uh, you can form in any of the 50 states. Some are known for being business friendly. We can put quotes on that and talk later about what that means, whether that means friendly for shareholders, friendly for management, etc., Lots of different entities involved in a corporation, but you can file it in any state, no matter where you live. You create it by filing something called the Articles of Incorporation or the Certificate of Incorporation, depending on the state. And sometimes this is called the Charter. Sometimes something else called the Bylaws is also part of that Charter. Uh, anyway, this Articles of Incorporation document will list the 
nature of the business activities, which you can write in really broad terms, any lawful activity, the number of shares to be issued, and who is going to direct it. We're going to come back to corporate structure in a bit. But the board of directors, for those of you who are anxious, they're the ones who run the company. Shareholders own it. Board of directors, they're the ultimate authority into what it does on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's that separation of ownership and control. The steps of a corporation's life are first, it's going to be incorporated. You're going to file a form, really simple. They're like a page long. Create a corporation in 10 minutes if you want to, although we can get into reasons why some of the other legal documents are pretty important as well. And once you have a corporation, it then can issue stock. Stock can be bought and sold, subject, of course, to a variety of regulations, including securities regulations. Once there are investors who are involved in the corporation, or at least a promoter, the investors will then select directors, and the directors are the ones who run uh, the company. And this happens by vote. So the shareholders, it, it's one shareholder, one vote. So if you have 51 shares and there are only 100 total, you pick the directors. No one else can really get a say. Of course, there are caveats and carve-outs. California has some special voting rules called cumulative voting. Uh, most states have straight voting. We're going to keep this a bit high level. And so just, if you want to talk more about the exceptions, we'll... We'll chat after class. But the idea being that one share, one vote is the general rule, and, uh, and that's how shareholders influence the corporate direction is effectively by voting for directors. In large companies, we have these annual meetings where directors are appointed, and it's inconvenient to go to all of them. You might have stock in dozens or hundreds or thousands of companies and you don't want to fly around all these meetings. So unlike America, where you have to cast your own vote for the president, for example, um, in our democracy, in the shareholder democracy, you can appoint someone to vote uh, by proxy. And that creates some interesting dynamics in the um, market for corporate control. So we have this annual meeting where stockholders uh, generally would vote for their directors, but the board, who they appoint, who they vote for and elect, uh, meet much more regularly than that, sometimes quarterly, sometimes monthly, sometimes more often, depending on the nature of the company. But at a very high level, the board's job is really to think about the overall structure and direction of the business, and uh, they're going to actually delegate a lot of the tasks involved in the day-to-day -day accomplishment of that to what we call corporate officers. The board makes the ultimate decisions, including the decision that's going to matter for this accounting topic, which is when to issue a dividend. See, the, the shareholders, they really can't do much aside from, well, they can vote for directors. Uh, they can sell their shares to somebody else if they're unhappy with the company and where it's going. And in some cases, they can sue the directors. Now, Director lawsuits, that we'll have to spend a few weeks on in corporations class. It's a topic I cover for weeks about what we call fiduciary duties. We're going to let that aside from here. We're going to focus on how shareholders can influence directors to issue a dividend. A dividend is paying some of the corporate profits to the shareholders, and it's the only way other than selling your shares that most shareholders ever see any money from their investment. Public corporations are subject to a lot heavier regulations than private corporations. So public corporations uh, do have to file a number of important financial documents with the Securities and Exchange Commission and provide various reports to investors. Uh, very interesting topic, very lengthy topic, really a specialized topic. This course is really designed for the generalist attorney who just wants to sharpen their business acumen. But if you want to go into securities regulation, then we're going to really need to drill down on some of the reporting uh, requirements there. But the bottom line is that it's costly to have a corporation. Uh, you need to pay taxes, you need to file reports, you have obligations, but there are benefits. And the benefits, as we'll see in a moment, uh, outweigh the costs in a lot of instances particularly with regard to its ability to have an indefinite life and its ability uh, to, to limit liability to shareholders. So let's get into that.
indefinite life of a corporation. What does that mean? The stockholders can die, but the corporation lives on. There are corporations existing today that are older than any living person. And the reason for that is the corporation does not need any particular set of shareholders to continue its existence. It's a separate entity, and it could theoretically continue in perpetuity. It only uh, comes to an end when it's officially dissolved intentionally, when it goes bankrupt and gets, or is otherwise judicially dissolved or, or has its charter revoked for failure to follow various regulations. And as I mentioned, some of these corporations uh, do last for hundreds of years. And that's an, uh, that's an advantage because it means that uh, your investment isn't subject to the natural life of a human being and that takes away some risk that that person's life may expire before their project was complete. The corporation uh, can have contingency plans and continuity plans to continue after uh, e even the, the, the demise and death of, of key persons. The other feature, which is super critical, is limited liability, meaning the corporation's owners can't be sued for more than they invested. And if the corporation fails, you know, the, the shareholders won't get their money back. They won't have made a good investment. But the creditors to the corporation can't go after the shareholders individually. If there's insufficient assets to pay the debts, if the corporation is bankrupt, if it owes $10 million and has $1 million, no one's going to come to your house and say, you're a shareholder in XYZ Corporation, so we put a lien on your house because the corporation couldn't pay its debts. This is in direct contrast to a sole proprietorship or a partnership, which is a type of business where you, the owner, are liable for an unlimited amount of money. And this is a huge advantage for corporations that they have this limited liability shield. Now, there are exceptions to it. Uh, we first off need to use words that indicate this limited liability so the rest of the world knows they're dealing with a corporation and have limited recourse. And in fact, there's a whole doctrine called piercing the corporate veil by which limited liability can be disregarded. Again, that's a legal subject for another day, but maybe that connects a few of your neurons as you're thinking through limited liability, which has to do with external debts and whether shareholders have to pay them. And again, they usually do not, which is distinguishable from sole proprietorships and partnerships and is often worth a lot of the hassle and cost. Those fundamental characteristics add up to an entity which is designed from the ground up really for acquiring capital, particularly through issuing stock. Corporations are designed for capitalism. Literally, they're designed to accumulate capital so that we can have divisions of labor and specialization, have professional managers doing certain things, while shareholders, who may be wealthy but not trained or interested or have the time to engage in certain activity, can profit from it by virtue of their investment in the corporation. Both small and large investors are able to participate because a relatively small cost involved with purchasing public stock. So anyone can go on MerrillLynch.com and buy a couple shares of Microsoft. With a public company, it's easy to pick up a couple shares with a few hundred dollars. Now, there are exceptions. Famous exception, Berkshire Hathaway, publicly traded company, and its shares are worth, I don't know what they're worth today, but let's say $100,000, probably more than that. So, you know, that's hard for most people to pony up that kind of cash. But you can buy stock in Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Apple, you know, and have a fairly diversified portfolio uh, for, for anywhere from $30 to $500 a share. Large amounts of capital can therefore be raised by corporations because we can spread the risks out to a huge number of people. It's cheap for people to be involved in lots of corporations, so they don't have to take on a lot of risk. So this is a great way for people to invest in a diversified way, and diversification is one way to eliminate certain kinds of market risk. A corporation only receives money when stocks are first issued. So when you think about stock markets, actually, when the, when the stock price of like Google or whatever goes, goes up or goes down, uh, the company's not paying for that. That's a resale market. Um, 
maybe think of it this way. If you go to the Ford dealership and you buy a Ford Bronco, then Ford makes money. But if you sell that Ford Bronco to your neighbor, Ford doesn't make any money, right? They don't make any money on the resale of your car. They, they sold it to you. Same with stock. When a company makes its initial public offering or an IPO, that's when it makes a bundle of cash. So why does it care? Why does a company care about its stock price? Well, that affects its ability to raise cash in the future. So if you sell more shares, so kind of think of it this way. If the, if the Bronco didn't sell very well and Ford goes to sell more new Broncos, you might have to lower the price to get people to buy it. Or if it was a really hot item and everyone loved that car, maybe in the next model year, they could charge a bit more. Likewise, a company could issue shares of stock today for $10 a share, and over time, those shares trade higher and higher. Now they're worth 30. The company could go back to the market, and this time it would sell shares for $35 a share, raising a lot more money. And for that matter, corporations usually do own some of their own shares and make some profits off of these changes. I mentioned earlier that corporations pay their own separate tax. That tax rate is different from the individual tax rate. In fact, it's lower now than it used to be. The corporate tax rate changes all the time. It's a fairly political issue. A lot of people think corporations should be taxed more. Others think they should be taxed less. The number goes up and down. And by the way, all of these tax rates, in my opinion, are really uh, not the main issue because the bigger issue is there are all these carve-outs, all these exceptions. So if you've ever studied tax law, you know the game is trying to really reduce what you're paying tax on. But in any event, uh, business tax rate is, let's just say, it's around 21%. And, uh, and so this is going to come into, into play as we figure out how much it costs when a, co a company makes money as a corporation versus if it makes money as a partnership or a sole proprietorship, etc. Um, but there are a lot of ways corporations avoid tax. Uh, Apple, very big company. It's worth like a trillion dollars. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Half of you are probably on Apple products right now. Um, that company apparently paid something like 2% tax rate uh, over the last several years because of a number of deals. So yes, corporations are taxed on their earnings separately and they are separate entities. How much that matters is a subject of some debate and discussion. There are many types of stocks. Uh, and, and there can be many different features that they have, or, or what we might call preferences, preferential features. So some stock gets more voting rights. You know, some might get 10 votes, another gets one vote, or some get five votes, and others get no votes. Some get what are called dividend rights. They're guaranteed a payment on a regular basis. Others get what are called liquidation rights. They get paid first if the company gets sold or goes bankrupt, or a variety of other preferential features. The rights depend on the class or type of stock hold. Now, most people have common stock, and publicly traded markets are mostly transactions in common stock because they don't have complicated preferences, and it's easier to compare one thing to the other, but these preferences do exist and do matter. So let's start with common stock. Common stock has some basic rights and privileges, which are usually attached. The right to participate by voting and what do you vote for? Well, you mostly vote for who are the board of directors. There are some other things shareholders vote for. There's these things called precatory proposals, which are recommendations. whoop de doo You can tell the company it should be more green or it should have more diversity on the board, but they don't have to listen to shareholders. They have certain rights to change some of the bylaws, but it's really pretty limited to voting for the directors who then make the major decisions. Shareholders also have a financial right to receive dividends when and if they are declared and the right to receive assets upon liquidation, meaning if the company goes bankrupt or if it sells or someone else buys it for a huge chunk of money, the shareholders get what's called the residual, whatever's left when everyone else is paid, will come back to that. So you have a financial rights and voting rights, but they're pretty limited. And for other classes of stock, we could either limit or add to these rights. And now we're getting into like sky's the limit stuff. There's all sorts of ways corporations can be structured, all sorts of preferences that may or may not be given to uh, various classes of shareholders. Another right shareholders may have, all well, this is typically a 
preferred stock or a preference is the right to maintain their proportionate interest. It's a pro rata right. So as I mentioned at the beginning, if you have one share of stock and the corporation has 100, you have 1%. 1 divided by 100 is 1%. And so that's how much ownership you have of the company. I also mentioned if you have 51 shares out of 100, you have 51%, and now you have a controlling interest. You can unilaterally decide who runs that company, at least in most states with straight voting, because your 51% is, well, it's a majority, and in, in, in every election will go your way. However, there are some limitations to this, particularly when a corporation could sell more shares. So if you have 51 shares and the corporation sells 1,000 more to somebody else, now you have 51 out of 1,000 share out of uh, 1,100 shares. Well, that's not a majority. That's not a controlling position. That's not very useful. So some shareholders will pay a little extra for a contract that gives them the ability to maintain their share percentage. And if the company is successful, uh, shareholders may also receive some dividends, which is really the subject of today's accounting lesson. Uh, and, and the value of their stock might increase. The perceived value of the stock might increase. And just like anything on a resale market, if its perceived value goes up, you can sell it for more and make a couple extra bucks. Some corporations issue different classes of stock, so meaning not just common. So we could have a number of different classes of stock because there are different classes of investors. Some investors want more management rights because they want to be involved. Others don't put any value on management rights because they don't even know what the business is doing. If you have $100 invested in, let's just use Microsoft as an example again, how much of your time and day are you really going to spend influencing Microsoft to change its behavior? How much is that going to matter to you? If you have $100 million invested in Microsoft, you might feel differently and you might want more control rights. So we can issue different types of stock to different types of investors and they can therefore, we can basically price, price different items based on what people want. And that's what gets us into preferred stock. Preferred stock is a class of stock where shareholders are entitled to many, many things, including and usually especially with public companies, the ability to receive dividends first or even guaranteed dividends. In return for this, preferred stockholders often give up their voting privileges, but that's not necessarily true. That's just a, a common exchange sort of quid pro quo. You give up this and you get that. Preferred stock is usually regarded as less risky than common stock. Um, they are guaranteed a certain amount of dividends, and they get paid first if the company goes bankrupt. Uh, but these dividends are usually a limited amount. And issuing preferred stock is important for a company because it means we can, if we issue this type of preferred stock with no voting rights, we might be able to raise some money uh, without giving up control. Now, the thing about this kind of preferred stock, I'm really referring here to uh, preferred stock, which is going to be listed by public companies and, uh, and, and ones that make these public reports. And so they're going to actually have to list them specifically and a number of rules to follow. With venture stock, these preferred stock rules go out the window. I'm, I'm, I'm really here talking about the type of preferred stock you and I and, and grandma have access to by virtue of being ordinary investors who participate in, in markets. So that's, that's stock in a nutshell, right? You got common stock, you got preferred stock. Common stock's real simple. It's pretty much the same vanilla thing all the time. Preferred stock, lots of variation. And it has preferences that are valuable to some people. And this allows different people to purchase different types of stock. Let's get into some nomenclature. And this actually is a, a slide I'm going to be bringing into my corporations class because I get asked this all the time. How do I distinguish all these different terms? Great chart coming up here. The stock of a corporation can have different status. And so let's get some of those terms out on the table. Uh, shares can be issued. They can be outstanding. They can be reacquired or what's called treasury stock. And so, again, drum roll, please. Here's the, here's the great slide coming up. 
this slide shows how to understand the different status of stock. Stock is first and foremost either authorized or it doesn't exist. The number of shares that can be issued is, is authorized by the Certificate of Incorporation, also sometimes called the Charter, uh, also sometimes called the Articles of Incorporation. And, uh, and that is the fundamental document filed with the state that says how many shares can be created, can be issued. So there's no such thing as unauthorized shares. That's like a, it's like a, it's a, it's a null set. Uh, authorized is sort of your baseline principle, and it's always going to be your largest number. Now, once you've authorized shares, doesn't mean you sold them. You know, in fact, there's there's a time delay. Like you authorize them by filing a document with the state. You have to do that first. You don't necessarily sell them the next day. In fact, it could be months, years. Unissued shares are authorized shares that have not been sold. Issued shares that have been sold. All right, so that's a nice, simple division between unissued and issued shares, right? That's pretty clear. And the thing about an issued share is once it's issued, it's always been issued. It, it kind of gets that status for life. That one particular share, once it's issued, it stays issued, even if it is repurchased. An issued share that's been repurchased, it doesn't flip into unissued. No, 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 no. An issued share that's been repurchased is called a treasury share. So that's another category. Shares that were once issued, reacquired, are going to be um, are going to be called treasury shares, and uh, not a very common concept. But those shares can be canceled, which effectively destroys them. Uh, and then we have issued and outstanding shares, and that's what's probably most interesting. Those are the shares that are actually held by investors right now. That they actually not 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 the business, but people have ownership over those shares of stock. So we just talked about how equity financing works, a couple basic concepts, common stock, preferred stock. All of that involving stock is equity. On the other side of the ledger, well, actually on the same side of the fundamental equation, but not an equity, those are all, stock is an equity, is, is a liability called debt. Debt is something you might be more familiar with, especially if you're a law student these days. Uh, or if you've ever taken out a credit card, uh, but basically a debt is, is a lot more commonplace for, for, for a lot of young people these days. They don't necessarily have the capital to invest, but they're getting their lives started by taking out various types of debts. And companies can, uh, can, can also take out debt, and it's a really important question. Should we be taking out debt or should we be selling stock to raise money? It's probably the most important consideration in deciding how to, how to capitalize a company. And let, let's look at the differences so that we can understand better uh, which is better for what kind of circumstance. Let's start with the hypothetical. Consider the example, the hypothetical example of old world corporation. It has 100,000 common stock shares outstanding. It's a growing company and it's profitable, makes money. And it requires $30 million to finance a new plant because it wants to grow even faster. With a new plant, it could really increase its capacity and start making way more widgets. Okay, so how are we going to finance, how are we gonna pay the $30 million it costs to make a new plant, a new manufacturing facility? We can explore multiple options. So let's take a look at those options. So we could, one, issue some debt. So corporations can issue these things called bonds. You go out and buy them. They work like debt. It's, it's kind of like going to a bank and asking for money, except you're asking the world for money. If you're a public company, you can issue bonds. And the thing about bonds is they're going to have a particular percentage rate, usually. And in this case, let's say it's 12%, which is, by the way, very high for 2021, but in any event, 12% due in three years, time to pay it back, or could issue an additional 500,000 common stock shares at 50, uh, $60 each, at $60 each. Management estimates the new plant should result in income uh, before interest of tax of $6 million. All right, take a minute and just digest that. Two options, issue debt, issue stock, right? Um, take on debt, we would say, or sell some stock. 
what's the best way to finance this plan? Let's go through how management would analyze that question. Let's look at the two options management has. We'll call them plan one. That's the debt plan. That's the 12% debt due in three years plan. Plan two is the stock plan, the equity plan, to issue an additional 500,000 shares of common stock at $60 each. Both cases, we're going to use this money to build a $30 million plant, which will generate $6 million of revenue per year. So that's our top line. So both plans are the same because we're going to use the money for the same thing. And uh, that that same thing is a plant, and that plant's going to generate an estimated $6 million bucks. And it, it, the plant doesn't care how you finance it, so it's going to generate the same amount of money no matter how you finance it, right? I mean, if you paid for your car with cash or you paid for it with a loan, it still goes 0 to 60 in the same speed, right? Okay, so our top line uh, income before interest and income tax, $6 million from the plant. All right, how much is it going to cost us? Well, at 12% a year, $30 million, we're talking simple interest here, but just to simplify, 12% of $30 million would be $3.6 million. That's going to really cut into our income. All right, the income was $6 million as a top line item. Now we have to deduct expenses. So that brings us to $2.4 million with debt financing. Six million still with with stock financing because the stock financing has no ongoing expense. Now the thing is, corporate income is taxed and it's taxed net of expenses, including financing expenses. So actually, we pay a lot more taxes if we take the preferred, uh, if we take the common stock financing route. We'll pay more taxes because we have more income before taxes. More income equals more taxes. So we multiply that by 21%, and we see that there's about 1.26 million in taxes with Plan 2 versus only $504,000 in taxes with debt financing, which means that after all is said and done, there are some expenses, uh, tax expense associated with common stock. And so you can see there the numbers of how much is available after that year to the shareholders. If we do a debt financing, there's only 1.9 million or so available to shareholders after we've paid the finance expense and the tax expense. There was much less expense because there is no interest expense or finance expense when it comes to prefer to common stock, at least at least the way we put it here. It's not really true. It turns out that selling stock is expensive. But that's money for the lawyers, so you should all be thrilled with that. In any event, under this simple plan, you're like, okay, great. So stock is better. But look what happened. We had to issue 500,000 shares to do it, which means we have a bigger pie. We have more slices in the pie. Your slice got smaller. The pie got bigger, but your slice got smaller. So you were actually not as well off. If, if we actually took the 1.9 or so million dollars and distributed it to the 100,000 existing shareholders, they get 19 bucks a piece. On the other hand, if we've now greatly increased how much income we'll have, but also greatly increased the number of shareholders, they're now only going to be earning $7.9 a piece. And so what decision do we make? We're going to base this decision off of a common metric, which has to do with earnings per share. You saw that in the last slide. Earnings per share is often quoted because that's really a nice comparable number. I mean, at the end of the day, do you really care if Microsoft is making a billion dollars a month or do you care how much of that money you're going to see? Most investors care significantly more about the latter. I mean, sure, a, a big company, all else being equal, uh, might be more secure and other things. Setting that aside, so the amount of net income earned in a year can be calculated as EPS very simply by just sort of net income divided by number of shares, and that is quite simply earnings per share. And earnings per share is a really relevant number because it helps you compare what's what would you rather buy stock in? 
you'd rather buy the stock that you get more earnings per share if the shares cost the same. So you have to look at that from your perspective too. But okay, if you have two choices, stock A is worth a dollar, stock B is worth a dollar. Stock A has a historical earnings per share of $5. Stock B has a historical earnings per share of $10. All else being equal, buy stock B. Wouldn't you rather have twice as much money? And that's how you might run that calculation. Let's talk about the distinction on a couple other levels. So there are several advantages for debt, at least for the common stockholders that already own shares, the 100,000 that own the shares, right? Advantage number one, as we saw, higher earnings per share. On this basis alone, the debt is more attractive, right? If we go with debt financing, we get almost 19 bucks a share. If we go with equity financing, we get just under eight bucks a share. Everyone I know would rather have 19 bucks than eight bucks, right? So that's a reason to pick the debt financing option once we've run the numbers. Number two, with 100,000 shareholders, you don't get diluted. There's no loss of control. You're not, issue, you're not issuing any other voting stock. So, and, and creditors, you know, the, the debt holders, they don't get to vote uh, in the corporation. Only shareholders get to do that. So there's no additional loss of corporate interest. And three, we lowered our income taxes. Everybody hates taxes, right? Interest expense paid on debt is deductible from income from income tax purposes. So uh, we can avoid a significant amount of income tax with the debt financing option. Sounds great, right? On paper, yes. On paper, so far, uh, you know, less tax, less dilution. Share this is going to make the shareholders happy the current shareholders happy. However, however, this is not the whole picture. The debt financing equation that we just ran isn't the whole picture because there's the possibility that the plant won't make six million dollars a year. Have you ever in your life tried something that you thought would be profitable and it turned out not to be? I'd be shocked if anyone in this room didn't have that experience, whether it was the lemonade stand that you tried when you were nine or the Girl Scout cookies that you pre-purchased and tried to resell or who knows, right? I mean, things don't always work out. The debt has to be paid. That's a fact of life. Debt has to be paid. It's a fixed expense. It must be paid. And what happens if that income isn't there? That's a problem. How do you pay creditors with money you don't have? And the whole debt is due in three years. So you have to owe this interest for three years. And then after three years, you got to have $30 million. Whether or not the corporation has done well, you pay the creditors. They get paid. They, there's things they don't get. They don't get to vote. They don't get the residual interest. They don't get to pick the directors, but they get paid or they can drive you into bankruptcy court. Stocks don't have to be repaid. Those are owners with a long-term interest in the company. So while the debt picture looked rosier at first glance, eh, maybe not. Let's talk a little bit more about stock transactions. And now let's get a little more technical. How do we record and disclose preferred and common stock transactions as an accounting matter? To demonstrate the issuance and financial statement presentation of the stock, we're going to assume that the New World Corporation is authorized to issue common stock consisting of an unlimited number of voting common and 100,000 non-voting preferred stock. That's already in the charter, no changes that's authorized. And so uh, how do we deal with that as an accounting matter? All right, let's book some, let's account for some stock transactions. One more concept I need to get out there before we can do this work. It's a concept called par value. Uh, par value is a really anarchic concept. Um, it's obviously still used in accounting, as you're going to see. It doesn't have a lot of relevance in law. Usually uh, what corporate lawyers do is they make the par value of stock extremely small so that you never... The, these, so par value is an old concept, and it used to be that you'd have a par value, which meant the minimum value 
that you would sell the stock at. It was illegal to sell stock for less than its par value. And by posting a certain par value, let's say you said the par value of this railroad stock is $3, then uh, investors would know they're not getting bamboozled if they paid three bucks. They know that was the lowest price anyone paid for that stock because it's illegal to sell it for less than par value. So this dusty old concept is a bit of uh, an anomaly in law, but you'll see it's relevant for accounting. But basically, it's a declared minimum value of the stock. That's what par value means. So on January 1st, 2015, New World sells 1,000 shares of $1 par value stock in its initial sale to first stockholders for $10 per share, which totals $10,000 cash. This is the journal entry. The cash part's easy. We got $10,000 cash put in the bank. That's an increase. We increase cash. What category is cash? Is cash an asset, a liability, or equity? Cash is an asset. So we increased an asset. How do we, in our T, in our T accounts, how do we uh, mark, which column do we mark when we increase an asset? Well, when we increase an asset, we put that in the debit column on the left. Just got to remember it, guys. Debits uh, we are, in the, uh, are going to be an increase to an asset. Stock is an asset, and so we're going to put 10000 there. Now, what are we going to do with the credit side of the column? Because debits have to equal credits for each of our entries. Well, this is going to be in the category of equities. We're going to also increase our equities because we now have more of those. And uh, how are we going to remark that we have increased those? Will we, will we increase equities? We put that in our credits column, which makes our equations balance. And we're first going to book the par value, right? The thousand shares of stock at a dollar par value is a thousand dollars. We're going to put that in common stock. And then we separately are going to have a line item for what we call paid in capital which is the amount in excess of the par value that we received. Now note that both common stock and paid in capital are both components of equity, and they're both increasing, and so we're increasing equity, and they both come into credits, but we do have separate line items for the par value and then the amount in excess of par. Here's another example, just slightly more complex, same basic principles on February 1st, 2015, 2,500 shares of $10 par value preferred stock are issued to the owner of land and buildings that have a fair value of $35,000 and $50,000 respectively. So before we even get into this, note that at the par value, 2,500 shares at $10 par value, that's $25,000. We're receiving more than that. Whenever we receive more than par value, we're going to have two separate journal entries in our equity, we're going to first journal that the stock sold at its par value. We're, we can never sell stock for less than its par value, at least not on its original issuance. That's called watered stock. It creates a number of issues. So we're going to have that line item. And then all of the excess is going to be put to paid in capital. That's the amount paid for the stock in excess of its par value. And on the other hand, we have assets which we now have, we didn't before, so we've increased our assets. We've increased our assets in land to the tune of $35,000 and increased our assets in the buildings on that land, $50,000. Our debits have to equal our credits. So let's add 35,000 plus 50,000, subtract the $25,000 of par value, and that leaves $60,000 of paid in capital for this transaction. Here's another transaction which gets more interesting. When people start a company, they usually issue themselves some stock. And if I was issuing myself stock, I wouldn't want to pay a lot of cash for it personally. So we issue that stock cheap. And in fact, uh, there's a number of good reasons for issuing first round of founder stock at a very low value. But sometimes founders actually put in more than the par value of their stock when actually building the company. How do we tabulate that? Let's look at transaction three. On March 1, 2015, 500 shares of a $1 par value common stock are issued to the organizers, the founders, the incorporators of New World to pay for their services valued at 
The journal entry is as follows. Well, we already know how to journal the entry of common stock at its par value, right? We Common stock, all stock has to be sold at least at par. So we actually are gonna book the par value separately on an original issuance has to be sold at par. Otherwise it's watered stock. So we're going to first book as a credit to our equity under the category or account for common stock, the $500. Simply 500 times one is 500. 500 shares of $1 par value equals 500. That's our, we're, and we increase equity. When we increase an equity, we put it in the credit column and there's our 500. The paid in capital we should be familiar with now too, right? Because we have an additional $4,500. What do we do with that? Well, that was paid in capital, excess of par. That's the additional 4,500. Now, I wouldn't blame you for not knowing this. It just so happens to be the case that generally accepted accounting principles allow uh, to book organization expenses as assets. So we're going to actually book a, uh, a debit to the asset under organization expense, which is a category of asset. And of course, debits have to equal credits. Uh, assets have to equal liabilities plus equity. And so we're going to add 5000 to the debits. And just in case you're keeping score at home, uh, I believe the most recent rules are that you can, uh, that you can depreciate uh, that organization expense over 40 years. Depreciation, probably a category for another time. But you should be familiar with at least how to book the common stock, which, again, we're going to separate its par value from its paid-in capital, which is the amount paid over par. So how do we do? Let's take a look at our balance sheet to see how these transactions were booked overall. And let's focus on the equity section and really expand on that. Here's what the equity section of the balance sheet would look like after we've properly journaled, ledgered, and tabulated uh, and communicated those stock transactions that we just discussed. Corporate law permits companies to purchase, repurchase some of its stock, meaning it can buy it back after it's been issued. Let's next talk about how we're going to record that transaction. It depends on what the company does after it repurchases the stock. If it repurchases the stock and then cancels them, the shares are no longer issued or outstanding. They effectively cease to exist. You can almost imagine that we've taken those shares and destroyed them. On the other hand, the company could repurchase stock and hold them in its treasury. Treasury stock is what we call issued but not outstanding. This matters for corporate law because in America, you can't vote treasury stock. And that's important because if you could vote treasury stock, it would make it very easy to manage, for management to maintain perpetual control over a company. It would just keep voting itself into office. So there are some additional rules around treasury stock to keep in mind. Let's now take a look at how we would, we would book these entries if, in fact, we are going to uh, repurchase stock and then hold it in the treasury. Transaction four is an example of a company that has issued stock and is now going to repurchase it and hold it in the treasury. Assume that New World Corporation decides to repurchase 200 shares of common stock on December 1st, 2016 and hold them in its treasury uh, so that uh, they are now non-voting shares, but they could be uh, re resold in the future, retransferred. So how do we deal with this? Assume that the price of each stock is the average issue price of the outstanding common stock, or $10. It's actually a very straightforward transaction. We have, uh, on the one hand, increased our amount of common stock, and now that common stock is going to be booked as an asset. We're going to hold it as an asset. We actually have something, a thing, which is valuable in the future. So we're going to increase the value of our asset called common stock by 2000. When we increase an asset, which column does that go in? It goes in the debit column. So we're going to debit common stock. We're going to debit that asset. What did we give up to get that? 
we gave up $2,000 of cash. Cash is an asset. When we reduce, when we deduct an asset, which column does that come from? It comes from the credit column. So we have a journal entry where we have on the one hand a 2,000 debit for the common stock we now hold and a $2,000 uh, credit for the cash that we spent to get it. So let's summarize where we are today. Assuming that we've booked all the transactions and we're gonna end the year, here's what the equity section of the balance sheet should show. Notice that the repurchase of stocks caused a decrease in total stockholders equity, a $2,000 decrease, and a decrease in the number of shares outstanding decreased by 200 in stock. If the 200 stock had been canceled, we'd have a different result. Then both the number of stock issued and the outstanding would have decreased by 200 stock. The next type of transaction is called a stock split. Stock splits occur when a corporation decides that its stock price is selling too high, making it impossible or difficult for investors to purchase the stock. For example, recently Tesla stock hit $500 a share. Not everyone has $500 to buy one share, and so maybe it's better if we had shares that were $50 each. We know that shares are just a percentage. If I have one out of 100 shares, it's the same financially to me as if I had 10 out of 1,000 shares or 100 out of 10,000, et cetera, et cetera. So, what can we do? We can do a stock split, which is going to potentially, potentially increase the marketability of a stock, meaning making it more accessible to more people, making it more approachable, more appealing, by lowering its price and increasing the number of shares that exist and that everyone has. See, in a stock split, the percentages don't change. The numbers do, but the percentages don't. Imagine that it's basically like if you took a photograph of a pizza and you zoomed it in and, and took a, a, a four by six photograph of a pizza and you expanded that into a eight by 10 photograph of the same pizza. Every slice is still the exact same percentage of the pie that it was before. They're all bigger, but there, there's, there's, there's no difference in its percentage. And that's the key thing about a stock split. Let's take a look at how to record a stock split. Again, a stock split is when a company increases the number of stock while proportionally decreasing the value of each share such that each shareholder maintains their value and holds a larger number of less valuable shares. And the reason for this is since shares can't be sold fractionally, you can only sell, sell whole shares, it might become more marketable. The shares in general might become more marketable because more people could afford $7 than 70. And this wouldn't necessarily make an economic impact. So anyway, stock splits are things people do. How do we account for them? A three to one stock split results in three new common stock replacing each currently issued share. So the number of issued and outstanding stock immediately gets tripled. The market price of each share decreases immediately to one third of its former price since there is no change in the dollar amount of the stock no debit credit entry is required to record the split there has been no change in value this is one of those entries i talked about where the effect is zero there's no financial effect of this but we still record it even though a stock split has no real financial effect, we still record it with a memorandum entry as follows, indicating the number of new stock issued and outstanding. Note that we make no numerical comment in the debit, credit, or balance columns, but rather have a memorandum entry that says something to the effect of, because of a three-for-one stock split, the issued and outstanding common shares increased respectively from 1,500 
and 1300 to 4500 and 3900. So we do document the event, but since it had no financial effect, we don't document it with our standard double entry method. There are no entries. It might be worth noting that we never use a single entry method. This is a zero entry method because there was zero financial impact. The dollar amount shown on the balance sheet and the statement of stockholders' equity will not change. The only change is a nominal increase in the number of issued and outstanding common stock. After the split, the equity section of the company's balance sheet would appear as shown on the screen. Next topic, let's talk about recording and disclosing dividends. Now, dividends are financial events, and they're financial events shareholders care a lot about. Both creditors and stockholders are interested in the amount of assets that can be distributed as dividends. Creditors might especially care because we don't want the Shareholders, the creditors at least, don't want the shareholders to drain all the value out of the corporation such that it will be unable to pay its debts. For example, assume total assets are $40,000, total liabilities are $39,000, and therefore total equity is $1,000, since assets always equals liability plus equity. And that equity consists of $900 in common stock and $100 of retained earnings. The maximum dividends that can be declared as an accounting matter in this situation is $100, the balance in retained earnings. In other words, dividends can only come from retained earnings. And this provides an effective limitation on how much dividends can be issued, which helps protect the interest of debt holders who are concerned that a company could become unable to service its debt if all of its retained earnings and its cash on the other side of the fundamental equation were distributed to shareholders in the form of dividends. Sometimes the board of directors may choose not to declare any dividends. Dividends are not a requirement. Unlike debt, debt has to be paid hell or high water. But dividends, dividends don't always have to be paid and the result is not bankruptcy. There may be financial conditions in the corporation that make payment impractical, as we will see. A corporation might not issue dividends where there's inadequate cash to do so. There are a lot of things corporations can do with their cash, including reinvest it in the business to grow the business. Corporations regularly reinvest their earnings in assets to make more profits. That's how growth happens. In fact, in startup and other high-growth companies, dividends almost never are paid. In this way, growth occurs, and through that growth, what we might call organic growth, the company then develops more of its own revenue. By developing more of its own revenue, reliance on outside creditor financing can be minimized, and we don't need to go get debt or sell more stock in the future. But as a result of this interest in growth, in reinvesting earnings in growth, there may not be enough cash on hand to declare and pay a cash dividend. Or it could be a policy of the corporation generally not to issue dividends. Again, startups almost never issue dividends because dividends are the antithesis of growth. Dividends are taking cash from the company and giving it back to shareholders. Startups are mostly about getting investment from shareholders that they can use to grow quickly. Some corporations never pay dividends, but instead always reinvest their earnings in the business. And again, this type of dividend policy is common in growth-oriented companies and almost ubiquitous in what we call startups. Companies might also refuse to issue a dividend because they don't have to. The board of directors may not decide to issue a dividend. 
And most corporations are in a situation where dividends are not mandatory. They are rather, they might, preferred stock might have a preference for dividends if and when declared, but there's no requirement that they are. If shareholders don't like it, they can either lump it or try to get rid of the board of directors through their voting rights and elect a new board which is going to issue dividends. Only the board can declare the issuance of a dividend, so shareholders can effectuate this by replacing the board. Or for that matter, they don't like it, they can leave. They can find another company to invest in. And there are companies with reputations for issuing dividends, and there are companies for reputations for never issuing dividends. Dividends may also be issued in stock as opposed to cash. Stock dividends are a way to conserve cash. And stock dividends, which we'll talk about after we discuss cash dividends, conserve cash while increasing the number of stocks that can be traded on the stock market, which has its own pro and con. We'll come back to that. Dividends can only be paid if declared by the board of directors. Only the board has the authority to declare the issuance of a dividend. The shareholders, they don't like it. They can try to fire the directors on the board and replace them with a new slate by voting for new people, but the board must pass a formal resolution authorizing a dividend payment. Notices are then published, and once a dividend has been declared, it then gets moved to the liabilities column and, like all liabilities, must be paid. Let's look at an example of a dividend notice. This is an example of a dividend notice. It's a simple example, but it's sufficient. It contains all the necessary elements of a dividend notice. There are three dates associated with a dividend. First is the date of its declaration, when it has been declared. Dividends are usually declared on one specific date. That date is distinguishable and usually different from the date of record, which is the date that the dividend is payable. So the dividend will be declared prior, in most cases, to the date on which it is payable. And the date of payment may yet be different from the date that it was payable. There may be a period of time between a payable dividend and a paid dividend. The date of declaration of a dividend is the time and day on which an official notice of the dividend was provided to the stockholders. It specifies the amount of the dividend as well as which stockholders shall receive such dividend. The liability for that dividend is recorded in the books of the corporation at its declaration date. In other words, on the date of declaration, the declared dividend becomes a liability. It's almost as if the board's pronouncement of the dividend's declaration itself creates the liability. The following entry would be made in the general ledger of New World Corporation on May 25th, 2016, on the date of declaration. This is, on your screen, a journal entry for the declaration of a dividend. The dividend payable, like an account payable, is a liability. On the date of the declaration of a dividend, it becomes a liability. And that's reflected by the entry in the journal of a credit for the liability under the account dividends payable. Remember that whenever we add to liabilities, we put that in the credit side of the ledger. 
this money comes from the retained earnings. That's the only place dividends can come from. So we would reduce the amount of the retained earnings account. The retained earnings account is an equity account. When we reduce an equity account, we record that on the debit side of the ledger. And therefore, our debits and credits equal in the following way. We increase our liabilities for the account dividends payable by a, an amount equal to the deduction of retained earnings under equity. The second relevant date in the issuance of a dividend is the date of record. Stockholders who own stocks on the date of record will receive the dividend even if they sold the stocks before the dividend is actually paid. The date of record is effectively the date we take a snapshot of the stockholder record. On that date, the stockholder record is frozen for the purposes of this dividend. The stockholders who own stock on the date of record will receive the dividend, and others who obtain that stock later are not entitled to the dividend. There is no journal entry for the date of record. This is effectively a null transaction from a financial perspective, but it has great impact from a legal perspective because this is the date that defines the rights of some shareholders to receive this payment. The date of payment is the third and final event, and this date of payment event is recorded as a journal entry. The dividend is paid on the date of payment, and on that date we shall record a deduction from our cash account. Cash is an asset. When we reduce an asset, which side of the ledger do we put that on? Reduction in an asset is a credit. So we put a credit to cash to show we have taken cash out of the cash account. We always have to balance debits and credits. So what shall be debited to account for this cash? Previously, we had credited dividends payable, dividends payable being a liability. Liabilities are things that, when increased, shall be journaled on the credit side of the ledger. We had previously put the increase in dividends payable in credits, and now we are getting rid, we are reducing that dividends payable. When we reduce a liability, we enter that on the debit side of the ledger. And of course, the amount of dividends payable that we reduce is the amount paid, which is equal to the cash used to pay it. And once again, we have balance between debits and credits. Preferred stockholder dividends are somewhat more common than common stock dividends. In fact, People usually purchase publicly traded preferred stock because it has a higher expectation or some reasonable guarantee of receiving regular dividends. Most publicly traded preferred stock has a dividend component, and often in return for getting those dividends, you give up your voting rights. Preferred stock is offered, therefore, to attract investors who have lower risk tolerance. They don't want the residual, they want regular payments. Now, the risk of getting paid on preferred stock is actually higher than getting paid on a debt. Because if a company doesn't pay its debt, the debt holder can drag that company into bankruptcy court. Preferred stockholders don't have this amount of leverage to force the payment, but they have a contractual and legal right to get paid before any common shareholders. Since they are paid before the common, they are in a less risky position than the common. After all, if they get paid first and there's not enough to pay the common, that's somebody else's problem.
So preferred stock is often in this interesting position of having slightly lower risk than common, higher risk than debt, and some reasonable assurances, but not a guarantee of receiving regular payments through a dividend. As a result, preferred stockholders usually receive a smaller but more predictable share of a corporation's profits. Preferred stockholders are entitled to dividends before any dividends are distributed to common stockholders, and most preferred stock states specifically what amount of dividends their holders can expect that year. Although, again, failure to pay these dividends does not have the same severe repercussions as failing to pay a loan. Dividends are often paid on preferred stock, even if the corporation experiences a net loss in a particular year, because the corporation will be hesitant to change the expectations of preferred stockholders that they shall be paid regardless of the overall health of the company. That said, once again, if the preferred stockholders are not paid, they do not have the same level of rights that debt holders do to bring the company to bankruptcy court. Preferred stock may also have other dividend preferences, especially in venture capital finance. Depending on what rights have been attached to the preferred stock, at the date of incorporation, or more importantly, when the certificate of incorporation is amended and restated to satisfy the demands or needs or interests of the new preferred stock investors. One such preference is the accumulation of undeclared dividends from one year to the next. These are called cumulative dividends because they accumulate. They build year upon year. In other words, a cumulative dividend, if not paid in year one, is still owed in year two. This is importantly distinguishable from a non-cumulative dividend, which, if not paid in year one, is not owed in the future. Cumulative dividend preferences are a feature of some kinds of preferred stock that requires any unpaid dividend in a year to be paid in future years. There are cumulative and non-cumulative dividends. A non-cumulative dividend, if not paid in year one, disappears in year two. A cumulative dividend, if not paid in year one, is still owed in year two, and importantly, It must be paid before any other dividends are paid. The cumulative dividends that have accrued, which have uh, accumulated over some period of time, must be fully paid first before any other dividends are paid onto the common. The unpaid dividends are called dividends in arrears. Dividends in arrears are not recorded as a liability because, in fact, although they must be paid before other dividends can be issued, they don't ultimately have to be paid for the corporation to continue as a going concern. Dividends in arrears are not recorded as a liability on the balance sheet of the company until they are declared by the board of directors. Once declared, they become a liability and must be paid. However, a disclosure of dividends and arrears does need to be made in a note to the financial statements. If a preferred stock has a non-cumulative dividend, it doesn't mean much because a non-cumulative dividend, if not declared by the board of directors in a given year, never has to be paid. Once that year expires, that non-cumulative dividend effectively disappears. So we see there's a whole spectrum of ways dividends can operate. We have common stock, which gets no dividend rights at all, unless the board feels like issuing and declaring one. Then we have preferred stock with non-cumulative dividends, which gives some expectation, but 
not one that has any teeth to it. The shareholders can't really force the issuance of that dividend. Then we have cumulative dividends. Those have a bit more weight to them because they pile up over time and they have to be paid off before other things can be paid. But the failure to pay a cumulative dividend even does not result in bankruptcy. And then beyond stock, we have debt and failure to pay debt. Now that, that can result in bankruptcy. Our last topic today is stock dividends because, well, it's more complicated, less common, but still important. A stock dividend is a dividend given to stockholders in the form of stock rather than cash. You give your existing shareholders more stock, and this has some obvious advantages. You don't have to burn your cash to give shareholders something, but it does reduce retained earnings. Now, it doesn't cause assets to change. It just reclassifies one or more shareholder equity accounts to a paid-in capital account. Uh, this is complicated. And it's probably beyond the scope of what most lawyers need to know. But let's just get familiar with it, and then we'll close this lecture, which has already gone on for an hour and 20 minutes. Like a cash dividend, there are three dates regarding a stock dividend, the date of declaration, the date of record, and the date of distribution. There is no date of payment, however. There was, of course, for a cash dividend. Those are paid. There's no payment. We don't, we don't refer to this as payment. We're sort of playing with accounting here. There is no cash payment involved for a stock dividend. Instead, stocks are distributed or given to the stockholders. Let's review how to account for a stock dividend. Again, I acknowledge this is not a point of accounting that is super important for most lawyers. So I'm going to move through these things quickly. If you find yourself, lawyers, in a position of, uh, of, of dealing with a corporation issuing a stock dividend, I will, I will admit that you'll probably want to brush up on this a bit. But there are some concepts in here that are generally applicable and useful, so let's go through it. To account for a stock dividend, let's assume for example, the Sherbrooke Corporation declares a 10% stock dividend to common stockholders. The stock dividend is declared, it's our first date, on December 15, 2015. It's payable to stockholders of record. The record date is December 20, 2015. And the distribution date, the stock dividend is distributed on January 10, 2016. What does this look like from an accounting perspective? At the time of the dividend declaration, the stock was trading on a stock exchange at $4 a share, and the equity consisted of the following. Common stock, $1 par value, 20,000 shares authorized, 5,000 shares of stock issued and outstanding, $25,000 total. Paid in capital, the amount in excess of par paid for common was $65,000. $100,000 in retained earnings at the time of the declaration and that adds up to $190,000 in total equity. The 10% declared dividend equals 500 shares because we calculate the dividend based on issued and outstanding shares. So 10% of 5,000 is 500. And we record the market price on the date of that declaration, which was $4 per share for the purposes of booking this transaction. Therefore, on the declaration date, the journal entry to record the dividend shall be a debit of $2,000 to retained earnings, meaning we're going to reduce retained earnings by $2,000 to offset the credit, the amount that we are distributing for the common stock. And that number is calculated. How much are we giving away? We're giving away stock. How do we value what we're giving away? I shouldn't say giving away as if it's so glib, but we are giving stock. Stock has value. That value is $4 per share. We're giving out 5,000 shares as part of this dividend. Four times 500 is 2,000. That's our credit. And that's how much we then deduct or debit, remembering that when we have a retained earnings is a type of equity. 
when we reduce equity, we put that in the debit column. So we've reduced our amount of equity by 2000 and we've recognized that as a credit in the amount of the new stock that is being issued also for $2,000. On the date of the distribution, we record another entry in which we say, one, that the common stock dividends distributable is debited $2,000. And that reflects and balances, first, the credit of the value of the common stock at par. Remember, it was 500 shares at a dollar par. And so there's that 500. And on top of that, the difference between what is the par and what is the amount paid? $4 a share. Four minus one equals three. Three times 500 is 1,500. And there we get our paid in capital in excess of par. And the effect of this transaction, the effect of these entries, is that we have transferred effectively $2,000 from retained earnings to common stock and paid in capital. No assets are paid by the corporation when the additional shares are issued as a stock dividend, and therefore the total equity remains unchanged. All of these transactions happened within the equity category of the balance sheet. Is there any change in the investor's percentage of corporate stock ownership because of a stock dividend? No. Since a stock dividend, like a stock split, is issued to all stockholders of a class, as a result of a stock dividend, each stockholder has a larger number of stocks, but the percentage remains the same. We haven't changed how many percentages people own. We've changed the size of the pie, not the slice of the pie. Let's take a look at that in one last illustration. This slide will show that when you have a stock dividend issuance, at least regarding one class of stock, you don't change the percentage ownership. Each stockholder will receive a specific dividend, in this case 10%, but their ownership percentage remains constant. Since total equity does not change when there is a stock dividend, the proportion owned also does not change. And here we have a chart showing the result of this transaction. Thanks so much for hanging in there for this ultra long marathon lecture, hitting up against 90 minutes. Whew. Well, jam packed, hopefully with a lot of good content. Let's conclude with a summary. Equity in a corporation refers to how much stockholders paid for stock and how much retained earnings the corporation generated that is now held as their property, so to speak. Stock splits make corporate stock ownership more accessible by reducing the price of a share, but they don't change the fundamental financial relationship between stockholders and each other and stockholders in the corporation, and therefore they don't need to be journaled there's no real accounting happening there. Cash dividends, however, must be recorded, and they're recorded on two separate occasions in two separate journal entries on the date of declaration and on the date of payment. In addition, there's a legal consequence for the date of record. And stock dividends function like stock splits, but they do need to be journaled in a similar way to cash dividends, i.e. recorded on the date of declaration and the date of payment, Anyway, the big takeaway for those lawyers out there, what I hope you come away with is an appreciation that companies make decisions. How do I finance operations? They have three choices. One, do I take on debt? Two, do I issue more shares of stock? Three, can I grow this organically through revenue, either cutting costs or adding revenue, cutting expenses, adding revenue? And the result of these decisions is really impactful on shareholders and their value. So as lawyers, let's try to be mindful of all the different business objectives and then recognize that our goal is to effectuate 
the client's needs while at the same time, hopefully being able to interface between the accountants, the business people, the marketing people, and provide some insight guidance based on our experience about when we want to use one method instead of the other, because it is rather complicated. But today we focus on the accounting aspects, and I hope that was helpful for you. So now you know how we book it. Thanks for hanging in there for this ultra long lesson. I promise I'll try to keep them shorter in the future, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.